novel. R E S P E W. R E S P We're gonna have some Skype, Skype issues, guys, as usual. He's so uncooperative. I have to force it to help the children. But we'll get there. How many times did you get around the floor? Oh, excellent. TJ was in the chat. Congratulations, sir. Oh, Lord Hosk, I see what you're saying. I am sorry. I I get it. I get it. I apologize. Right, that was a terrible Just mistake on my part, but I can't take it back now. But we'll do a draw for the other bear later, so maybe I'll pronounce your name right that time. I remember, guys, <laughs> if you want to get your call, your questions in to, uh, for Jimmy, get over to the blog, scroll down a little bit, find his entry. We're ready on Skype. We are ready on Skype, which means I think we have Jimmy with us. Jimmy, are you there? Can you hear us? Yes, I can. How can you guys hear me? We can. Yeah. Hey, Jimmy, how's it going? We're so tired, Jimmy. Uh, he's, he's <laughs> Who's, uh, oh, 97 hours bust is freaking fantastic. I, uh, I'm in awe you should, of you guys. You should come hang out. It's fun. I should. I saw Tara was there. Uh, I know Tara from Seattle, so I'm so glad that you guys have some some local blood over there. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of Seattle folk. Um, so just really quickly for people in the chat who might not know who you are, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Jimmy Wong. I am an avid uh, Desert Bus player. I've done the most <laughs> Let's Plays of Desert Bus ever. I'm just kidding. I uh, I'm an actor and musician from Los Angeles, California. Oh, from Seattle, Washington. Now living in Los Angeles, California. I have acted in uh, some shows you may have seen. Video Game High School is sort of the most well-known on the interwebs. Um, I also have a cooking channel called Feast of Fiction, where we cook up fictional feasts. So uh, Butterbeer from Harry Potter, what would that be if it was in the real world? Uh, so we sort of make the real-life analog of what uh, food and stuff is in fiction. And I also love Magic the Gathering. That's how I know Loading Ready Run, uh, those wonderful people. And I host... <laughs> I guess I'll keep going. I host a podcast for Commander uh, called The Command Zone with my good friend Josh Lee Kwai. Which appears to be sort of everybody in chat is very hyped about. I think oh, you, have, good. you have a lot of uh, Commander fans, Commander uh, Command Zone fans in chat. So, And I, I see quite a few magic related questions in our comment section. So I'm, I feel like this oh, is going to be a magic chat, which I'm okay with. Woo! Everybody likes yeah, magic. Yeah, me too. I love the explanation of how to play magic, that seven minute ramble of oh, with both. <laughs> Both players drawing from the same deck. I yeah. was busting up laughing. Yeah, that was pretty incredible. Um, so I guess I'll I'll lead it off with a question for myself. Um, you were on the Community Cup this team this year for uh, the community side uh, yep. against Wizards of the Coast. How was that? Did you enjoy it? It was excellent, and this was one of the years that was produced by Loading Ready Run, and it I think was the best Community Cup ever. Partially for that, and also because our team was particularly awesome. Your team but was yeah, very it was, stacked. It was, <laughs> Yeah, it was stacked, but it was great. It was because, I mean, like, Wizards has wanted to win that. You can tell when you go in, they're like, the community should win, but we don't want to lose. Uh, and so it was really funny because no one wants to, I mean, because I'm imagining they get thrown a lot of shade when they go into work the next day and everyone goes, oh, how was uh, losing in the community cup? Uh, so it was a lot of fun. It was a really intense environment, and it was great because I got to play the new set early. I got to meet a lot of my friends that I've only seen on stream, like, Numat the Nummy and Gabriel and the Manosaurus and I got to meet all the LRR guys as well so it was a lot of fun um, and I'm very honored to have been picked by Wizards themselves sort of handpicked for the Community Cup. It was a great honor. Awesome. All right, let's get to some of these uh, fan questions. Preston is asked, asked, what is your favorite and or current commander? Or who is your, sorry. Hey, uh, so one of the first decks I ever built was Jaleva, which is a Grixis. Hey, Tara! Which is a uh, Grixis commander, so that's red, black, and blue. And that evolved eventually to become my favorite, which is Marchesa, uh, who is a, a very mean commander. She has this special recursion ability, um, and I'm a fan of value in Magic the Gathering, as I'm sure we're all fans of value in real life as well. 
which means I get to do a lot of stuff and I get, I get to keep doing it over and over again. So that's my favorite commander because I love Enter the Battlefield effects. I love repeating them over and over again to take advantage of the game. Awesome. What is it, what is it about commander that really pulled you in? Uh, so I played Magic when I was very young. I grew up in Seattle, and back in third grade, I remember playing outside on the pavement, and it, of course, being the kid that admired everyone's Shiv and Dragons and other giant things that were red and flew and had dragon in the name. Uh, and I stopped playing for a long time. I played other card games in sort of the interim, and I got back into it uh, a year and a half ago now because one of my friends said, hey, there's this format where you don't need to sort of buy new cards to keep current. That didn't stop me from buying new cards. Uh, <laughs> And uh, you can use all your old cards to play and make decks out of it. So I was really excited that, and, and he also said it was multiplayer. And I've been playing a lot of board games that entire year with my good friend Matt Arnold. Um, and playing stuff like Dominion and um, what else? Uh, other card building games and, and like Seven Wonders had sort of gotten me into this. Like I love the aspect of a multiplayer game. And I love knowing that I can play uh, Magic the Gathering with other people. And it isn't just sort of this one-on-one -on -one, very intense format where it's, you win or you lose, and you get salty if you lose. So I love the multiplayer aspect of it, and that's what got me into it, and it's sort of been smooth sailing since. Awesome. Um, somebody would like to know if you have any good advice for people trying to sort of break into the format, but on a bit of a budget. Well, Wizards does this really nice thing where they want to sell you products because they're a company, and that is their main goal in life, it seems, to also make a great game for you. So what they've done is every single year they're releasing pre-constructed decks specifically for commander and you can go pick them up from any big box retailer and it's a great way to start it's a low price point you get a full deck that you can just leave up and play immediately uh and that's a great way to start uh the big thing though is like finding a group of friends to play with and this is i think something that we run into in every aspect of life um that's why i think xbox live and playstation live and all the sort of live services are really important because a lot of kids don't have people to play with and so it's like hey look you can just go online and find eight other people that are interested in fragging noobs with you or whatever uh, and it's a bit harder for tabletop games because you have to go to a store to find someone or you have to have someone else that is like hey I want to play this game with you uh, go buy a deck and we can play so everyone has a local gaming stores in most states countries cities towns villages huts etc uh, you can look it up online. Uh, Wizards has a, a site where you can search for gaming stores around you that sell magic stuff and a lot of times these places will have like Wednesday night commander nights where people will just come in to play commander specifically and you'll find a whole range of players there usually and it's kind of one of those things where it's like you gotta step outside your comfort bubble a little bit you have to be able to approach someone or have or be open to being invited into a game and knowing that you may lose or knowing that you may be the newest player there and there's a little bit of hoping too that like everyone will be nice to you when you play as well but I think commander is casual enough of a format and everyone has a point where they remember starting off at the game that it should be pretty simple I think and hopefully welcoming for you to get into the game great um, Canadian Highlander have you heard of it I have why is it called Canadian Highlander did Canada invent it I can answer this one all right so originally there was an Australian Highlander as well as a German Highlander uh, they use in Australia they use a 60 point list and a band list uh, Germany has a hundred card lists and a band list uh, we invented the points list, sort of based on their band list. So since we have a slightly different format and we wanted to get it out there, we just called it Canadian Highlander. Ah. Yeah. So it is not the nicest of the formats then. I think it's nicer. We, we include all of the cards. Yeah, but you can play Power 9, which I think is pretty insane. Yeah. Um, well, the nice thing, the reason I like Canadian Highlander is uh, I've seen Marshall Sutcliffe and a few other uh, people play it online, and I think it's, it's a 1v1 format, so it's not a multiplayer like EDH is, and you do get to play like a Mox and some of the most powerful cards in Magic's history, but the, the nice part is that I think you don't have to play those cards to make a deck competitive because it's one out of 99 cards. The chances of you even drawing it in the first place is low. So it doesn't actually increase the power level of your deck that much. That's another reason why I like EDH so much is that it has a very uh, high variance level, and every game is going to be different. So I think I will make a deck. If I do, however, it will be Infect, which uh, is apparently everyone's least favorite uh, mode of playing the game. <laughs> I like it quite a bit, though, because it means you get to win twice as fast. Exactly. <laughs> All right, let's shift gears a little bit and move into the uh, your acting career. Uh, sure. We'll go with, uh, he was a person here, a uh, huge fan of your character in Video Game High School, especially with the more emotionally difficult episodes in Season 3. 
Uh, what was it like trying to take a very upbeat character into those very low and serious situations? Woo diddly. So if you guys haven't seen Video Game High School, it's three seasons. It's on Netflix. It takes all of eight hours to get through the entire thing. The first season's 90 minutes. The second season's like three hours, and the third season's about four. Um, it's a TV show, quote-unquote. It has like full-length episodes. And every season we get more and more serious and less and less campy and like start touching on more broad and darker issues. Uh, so my character, Ted, uh, my dad is played by my brother, Freddie Wong. And he's this alternate version of himself where he never stopped playing rhythm games. He actually was like a competitive guitar hero player for a little bit. Uh, and so the version of him in the universe is someone that never got over that and is now like the washed up teacher that teaches the version of like band at a video game high school, which is just rhythm games, which no one takes seriously. And he treats his son like utter crap. And he finally, there's, a, there's finally a moment in an episode where a, a lot of things turn, a lot of things change, and it's up to Ted, who's normally like the upbeat best friend, Ron Weasley character. Oh, by the way, Video Game High School is Harry Potter with video games. There's literally no other difference. It's like <laughs> every character is in a direct analog. Uh, so uh, it was a really interesting experience. I have to give major credit to the people that both wrote the script and the directors because they... Uh, put an enormous amount of trust in the actors to sort of deliver these really high intensity emotion scenes and it uh it definitely was a challenge for everyone involved because everyone in that season had sort of their version of that and it, i mean just like major props to the to the directors and stuff for really setting it up really making sure that everyone was comfortable in in with each other and also with the material and really rehearsing it properly and making sure that the actors understood what was going on so that we really knew how to approach it, both going into it, what the character was really feeling. And, um, you know, it was, it's definitely probably one of the most intense and difficult acting experiences I've ever had, but I think it was made much easier by sort of the help of everyone else around, making sure that everyone was on the right page when we got into it. So it's a good question. Awesome. Um, the, the show had a bunch of really great uh, fictitious games. Uh, yes. If there were any that could actually exist, which one would you love to see? Uh, I would love to see, I mean, that's my, what my character does, but I'd love to see more games that have drift racing in it. Um, because drifting is like the most just un... It's just stupid, right? What is the point of drifting a car around the corner? You're not taking the corner any faster. You're making the whole place smell like garbage. You just hear smell burnt tires everywhere. But it looks so sweet. You guys ever seen Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift? Anyone? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah. So like that's my favorite of the whole series because it's like it's not about like oh high octane American muscle cars going as fast as we can from zero to sixty. I'm Vin Diesel. It's like let's do some sweet ass flashy stuff and look ridiculous, but also really stylistic while we do it. So I would love to see more games that just focused on making drifting as glorified as possible. Um, because all the other games, I mean, that's also cool. We had Pokemon, which is our version of uh, a gambling version of Pokemon in the, in, the, in the universe, so that would be really fun, too. But Japan already has all this. Like, in Pokemon, you'd put cards down and little, like, animations would pop up. If you go to Japan, there are arcades where you can collect cards and put them on the screen, and then they'll pop up on the monitor in front of you, and it looks super sweet. You can, like, battle monsters and stuff, and it, it's like Japan has leveled up their video games and arcades much more than we have. So awesome. something like that would be pretty cool. Sweet. Um, you mentioned your uh, YouTube channel, Feast or Fiction. Yes. Um, some uh, someone's asking if you'll be including any more Steven Universe food. Yeah. Fish, well, the first thing. Fish stew pizza, yeah. perhaps, is the suggestion <laughs> here. Fish stew pizza. Um, I have to give it up to. Uh, there's been a bunch of shows and cartoons recently that all have been putting fictional foods in their shows. And when I first did the show, I was like, we're gonna run out at some point, right, guys? And four years later, we're like, we have a list of like 70 that we can still do. Uh, so that's great. Uh, the first thing I need to do is actually watch Steven Universe. Have you guys seen it? Anyone there seen it? Yeah. Yeah. There's so, a lot of very big heard, Steven Universe fans here. I've only seen a couple episodes of the show to study for the specific uh, feast that we made from those. But from everyone else that I've talked to, it's like, yeah, after I started watching season two, I basically cry every episode. <laughs> <laughs> So I really want to watch the show itself, and the next time we do a Steven Universe uh, uh, feast, I want to actually really make it true to the show and, and have it something that fans can appreciate, because I'm pretty sure I'm going to be a fan of the show, too. So i got to get through the show first, and we'll get back to it. All right. Uh, well, lots more magic questions here, so let's uh, head back in that direction. What are your oh, thoughts? Oh, good magic the gathering. I know. What are your thoughts on uh, Tiny Leaders? Did you ever play that format? Never did. Uh, never want to. Sorry, guys. A lot. 
people are always like, "Why? Well, when are you guys going to do an episode on the Command Zone about Tiny Leaders? And it's this sort of thing that like popped up in some local gaming stores across the country uh, and then sort of didn't really go anywhere. People were, were hailing it as the new commander, but we called it Legacy Light. The whole point is in your deck you can only have cards that are three mana cost or less. And uh, the older the formats go in Magic, the cheaper the cards have to be to cast because in some formats you can just win the game on turn zero or turn one because you can just play all the cards every hand because they cost one, two, or three mana. So Tiny Leaders puts that restriction on you. It's like Commander uh, where it's singleton, but you can only have 60 cards, I think, in your deck. I'm not yeah, sure. And, yeah. and they all have to be three mana cost or less. The problem is that it's really price restrictive because a lot of the more powerful cards cost less um, historically. I think if you put a graph up of the most expensive cards in Magic's history, the most expensive ones would be on the ones that cost between one and three mana. Uh, and so we didn't really, I didn't like it because of that, and also just because it didn't really pick up anywhere. So I haven't gotten to play it that much. I'm not a huge, it didn't like entice me originally as much as Commander did, so I've yet to play it, really experience it, but it's something that I don't expect I'm going to really love. It seems, like, it seems like it kind of burned very bright for a very yeah. short amount of time. Um, I read this question, and that's the first time I've actually thought about Tiny Leaders in about six months. So, <laughs> Join the club, except yeah. when someone tweets about it. Um, do you play much uh, Commander on Magic the Gathering Online? I do not. I probably will soon. They're releasing this Legendary Cube, which has a lot of cards that are Commander staples in it, and you can win prize packs from that cube. Uh, the reason is that I make enough mistakes in real life that I don't want to transfer my feel bads into the computer realm, because... <laughs> With Commander, there's so many more levels of interaction, and you have to sit there clicking yield, okay, or whatever, over and over again. And if you miss a trigger there, like that could be potentially game ending. And I don't know, there's just something that's so interesting to me about sitting across the table from three other people and going, whoa, 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 hold on. Why are you doing this? Because and you, you, know, you can like use the logic to battle your way out of a bad situation. There's so many times I can count on sort of like me or someone else saying something and essentially saving their life because anytime you say something, it's always in your own best interest, but you always try to pose it like it's in everyone's best interest or it's what they should do. So it's like this passive control game where you're trying to get other people to bend to your will or you'll bend to their will because they'll bend to your will later. Uh, you play the card will bender. Uh, so there's a lot of like really sort of deep interaction between players. I think that's the joy of the game, and that's why I play it. Awesome. Um, and to, go ahead. And to go infinite. <laughs> um What's your dra favorite draft format? Do you draft uh, very my much? My favorite draft format is drinking whatever that person just brought into the room is. Uh, it's not a drink. Those are scissors. Scissors. Oh, man. It looks like <laughs> this beautiful Tropicana fruity drink. Uh, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> uh, draft format. Do you draft? Are you a limited yes. player? So drafting is the second thing I do most above playing commander. Uh, I think drafting is a great thing for new players to learn how to do as well because it enca encapsulates all the best parts of Magic the Gathering, where you get to open booster packs, you get to build a deck, and then you get to freaking play it. Uh, my good friend Daniel told that to me, and I was like, this is the most true statement in the world. I love drafting. I think it's great. Uh, someone else compared it to like getting, figuring out what tools you have in the garage, putting them together, and, and trying to battle with like a weird lawnmower machine with like spinning rotor blades and stuff on it. And I was like, yeah, that sounds about right for limited. <laughs> Uh, so I really love it. I think it's great. It's it's always changing. It's never the same. And it's awesome because there's a whole section of Wizards R&D, Research and Development, that devotes their time to making sure that when you get to play a set um, and draft it, it's great in the draft environment where you get to open packs and make cards. It's also good in Standard where you get to play it with the two other blocks that are in the rotation or whatever. And it's great in Modern. And I think it's such a complex thing that people don't give R&D enough credit for creating such a multifaceted universe within a single set release. Um, and that's why I really like it, is because you get to really play around and understand the whole set, and then when you're moving on to the next one, it's a whole new adventure. And, but you get to take your experiences from the last one and the lessons you learned and get better with each iteration and each new set. So you always feel yourself getting better at something, um, unlike Desert Bus, which I don't think you ever feel like you're improving at. Uh, uh, well, I, I, I would disagree. Really? Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you definitely do get better at it over the years, Telly. I've, I've developed a technique, for sure. Every driver has their style. You know, Ashton's Ooh. gotten really good at driving without looking at the road for whole minutes at a time. I think he has a counting system of some kind. I think is that he how he can. drives a wheel? Because that is terrifying. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I bet there's a, a much lower ceiling for the upper limit of how good you can get at it. But I, I think got there's you. room for improvement. 
Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, in that case, that's great. Maybe it's more of a slow burn, but I mean, I don't know. When I, when I play games or when I do anything like, I don't know, I grew up playing piano and stuff. Like, it's one of the most satisfying things you can do. I, I rock climb a lot too, is going back to something, doing it again, and knowing that you are better than you were before. Um, like, it's, it's a very satisfying feeling in video games, in almost anything you do in life. Even like, hey, I can type faster than I could yesterday because Mavis B can help me out, you know? Awesome. All right. Let's, uh, let's get two more questions in here, Jimmy. Um, uh, so last one before we ask you uh, something we've asked all of our callers. Uh, we know you love magic. We know you're a YouTuber and you're a musician and an actor. What's something we do not know about Jimmy Wong? Uh, <laughs> uh, there are a few things. I, uh, I've had many interesting jobs over the years. I was once a street canvasser. So that means I was the annoying guy on the roads in Seattle at the popular areas. I would walk up to being like, hey, do you have a minute to talk about saving some kids' lives? Uh, I was that annoying butthole. Uh, <laughs> at one point in my life, I was also a, uh, a DJ at a strip club called uh, Crazy Girls on La Brea and Sunset. That was my summer job because my friend, uh, his name is Boston Chris, aptly put, uh, gave it to me because he was he was leaving town that summer and he for some reason was the DJ at a strip club called Crazy Girls and I took over and that was probably the most traumatizing and worst job I've ever had in my entire life. All right, let's wrap this up with the $9 Nemesis Challenge. It's something we've been asking all of our guests and Collins. Uh, if you were to be a super villain, who would your yeah. nemesis be? Right. I remember when you guys asked just the Ashley, and she changed the question on you, and I like this version a lot more. <laughs> um, if I was a supervillain, I believe my nemesis would probably be someone like Aquaman, because one of my worst fears is dying by drowning. I yep. think it's just hey, like me this, too. Join I, the club. I think the ocean <laughs> is terrifying. Um, uh, when I watched Casino Royale and Vesper drowns at the end of that movie, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, too bad, go away. Uh, <laughs> That was like, oh, I had a small heart attack in the theater when I saw that. So if I had to have an arch nemesis, it would definitely be someone that controlled the oceans. Awesome. All right, well, Jimmy, thank you so much for calling in. Let the fine people at home, let, the, let them know where they could find you online. Yes, absolutely. You can find me at twitch.tv slash desert bus. Please keep contributing money to this <laughs> awesome, amazing, amazing campaign. Uh, the bus cam is never going to stop, guys. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, at JF Wong, and you can find my YouTube stuff if you just look up my name, Jimmy Wong, or you can check out my Command Zone podcast about Commander at rocketjump.com slash the Command Zone, or uh, at Command Cast on Twitter. So I'll, I'll type that crap out into chat. Am awesome. I going to get banned from the link? No, no, you're good, you're good. Yeah. Well, you look forward to watching Steven Universe. Uh, I'm going to look forward to, once I get away from this madness, going and uh, watching some more of your shows, actually. Yeah, please do. Awesome. Uh, Feast of Fiction is something that I think everyone can enjoy, so make sure you guys check that out. That's great. Well, thank you so much, thank Jimmy, you. for calling in. Thank you, guys. I love you so much. Good luck. Good job. We need 300000 freaking dollars. <laughs> Jesus. Woo! We're going to keep going. We're going to send one person to college by the end of this. It's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, talk to you later, Jimmy. Right, real See you guys. All right, everybody, that was the always wonderful Jimmy Wong. Uh